our first speaker for tonight. Uh, Andy Andres is a senior lecturer of natural science at the College of General Studies. He's an expert in exercise physiology, nutritional biochemistry, and most importantly uh, for all of us here tonight, baseball. Uh, Professor Andres is also an MLB data, uh, data caster at Fenway Park, a data analyst for BaseballHQ.com, a site that I'm sure some of us, including myself, have wasted far too much time at, uh, as well as head coach and lead instructor for the MIT Science of Baseball program. Recently, Professor Andres taught a MOOC uh, titled Sabermetrics 101, Introduction to Baseball Analytics on BU's edX platform. These pursuits allowed this lifelong Red Sox fan and athlete to synthesize his twin loves, baseball and scientific inquiry. So thank you very much. Thank Professor. You. Well, thank you all for being here. I um, want to try to make this, this idea come across that baseball can be a science. And when you think of science, normally people think of lab coats, courses they didn't like in high school, reagents, beakers. That's what people think of when you think of science. When here at Boston University, you think of the physics department, the biology department, the chemistry department. But I want to make the case that baseball can be treated as a science. And baseball, for me, has become an academic pursuit. So I'll try to make this case for all of you tonight. I teach a human genetics course to non-majors in the College of General Studies. And just this week, we've started talking about what actually, actually is the definition of science. And it starts with empiricism. Empiric and empiricism comes from Aristotle, essentially, where he's been quoted to say, there's nothing in the intellect, nothing in the intellect, without first being in the senses. And this is the nature of one of the ways of knowing, which is a sensory way of knowing. So here's some definitional stuff that we always start with in any science course. Let's get our terms straight. Science is a methodological approach to studying the natural world. It asks basic questions, such as how does the world work? So how does baseball work? How did the world come to be? Well, how did baseball start? What was the world like in the past? What, what is it like now? And what will it be like in the future? All of these things, can, you can put baseball in there and start making sense of it. But I want to make the case again that the fundamentals of science is that it's observational. Here's another very important component of science is good science is based on the information that can be measured or seen. Seen, stuff that we measure or see is the basis of good scientific pursuits. And the scientific method, it could be said, is just one way of learning something. And anything that can be seen or observed is amenable to scientific investigation. So we, if we see it, essentially, we can start investigating it, and we can start treating it like a science. I'm not sure how, oh, there we go. Oh, uh, too, too far. This is an image of Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe is shown here because he's a very fam famous astronomer, but what he's really famous for is creating this huge observatory on an island. And he really is sort of the first big data practitioner. You probably heard the term big data. He collected tons of data at his, ob at his observatory. Get it? Observatory. Seeing. He's watching and observing. And he's collecting data that changed the world. The data collected by Bra and then formalized more thoroughly by Kepler really changed how we view the solar system. It was a revolutionary idea, started by big data collection and observation. This is, oh, there we go. It's hopefully I go one at a time. This is Charles Darwin. Same idea. He's an observer. He observed the natural world on his voyage of the Beagle. And he looked, he looked at all these different living forms and put together his theory of natural selection as it described the connectedness of the living world. Observational. It's what he saw. So I want to take this notion and, and transform it to baseball. I observe baseball an awful lot. It, I work for Major League Baseball, and I score the game, so I have to pay attention and watch the game extremely carefully. There's probably nobody in the ballpark when I'm working 
watching the game more carefully than I am, because I have to record every single pitch and event that's observational. And it creates this rich data set that analysts now can use to better try to understand the game, to understand baseball as a game better. So that's the, that's the point here. <clears throat> is that me? I'm sorry. So I want to go to Hollywood. Hollywood even is talking about the science of baseball. Let's see if we can show this clip from the movie Moneyball. So why did you return my call? Because it's the Red Sox. Because I believe science might offer an answer to the curse of the Bambino. <laughs> because I hear you hire Bill James. Yeah. You know, why someone took so long to hire that guy is beyond me. Well, baseball hates him. So, baseball hates Bill James, but the quote here is that he believes science might be the offer, the offer the answer to the curse of the Mambino. The idea of using advanced analytics, understanding the game better, and taking that to an approach to winning games is essentially what many teams in Major League Baseball have done, and it's really the thesis of the book Moneyball and the movie Moneyball, and it's sort of captured here in this little scene in the Fenway press box at Fenway Park. So, um, I want to run through different parts of baseball that are scientific. I want to talk about the biology of baseball, the physics of baseball, and some of the analytics of baseball, the statistics, and some of the numbers we can use to analyze the game better. Uh, let's see how I'm doing here. I'm going to show you a clip of Barry Bond's swing. Now, this is low resolution, but let's look at his swing. And this is what a biomechanic does. A biomechanic is watching his swing, if we can see it there. There we go. Thank you. And, and we can start talking about the components of the swing, of launch, of foot plant, of the rotation. Now, this is a terrific swing. And for those coaches out there, for the coaches, this is what you want to model it as a coach. There's so many components to the swing, but we can study the biomechanics of baseball. Next is Daniel Bard. Can we show this video too? Daniel Bard the Good. This is when he was in 2010. It was phenomenal. Now, these are just a short video against the Yankees. I'm going to slow this down for you in the next video. Hopefully we get there. Here's, here's a slow motion video of the same two pitches. On one side, it's Derek Jeter, 99 mile an hour high fastball. On this side, it's a two seam fastball, a sinker against Swisher. And if you watch this video, watch the reaction of the catcher on Swisher and also Swisher himself. They're shocked at the movement of this pitch here. Watch it starts out that way, and watch how it just drops off. That's a nine, that was a 98 mile an hour pitch that moved about 18 inches. This is phenomenal athletic performance, but as analysts now, we can start studying the components of great athletic performance by using technology to see the velocity of the pitch, the location of the pitch, and the movement of the pitch, which is fundamental to understanding good pitching. So that's Daniel Bard, the good, but now we can use data that comes from Okay, here we go. We're going to show, I'm going to try to show you uh, the, data, the data set and the technology that gets this. Can you advance the slides maybe? There we go. Some of you who know baseball, watch baseball, care about baseball, you, you see modern game day technology that shows you the different kind of pitches and how it, how, how it fits in the strike zone. This is the fundamental pitch FX data that analysts now use. And I want to show you, maybe, maybe you can advance slides from now on. We'll do it that way. I want to show you Daniel Bard. Now I'm going to go back and forth. This is Daniel Bard. And what we're seeing here is the movement of his fastball. That red patch here is, how, is where the fastball goes. And he, he spins it so hard and throws it so hard, it actually rises above what you'd expect from gravity. It moves arm side, too. There's an arm side move and it rises. But this is 2010 when Daniel Bard was lights out. If we go forward two slides real quick, you can see the red patch move and go back two slides. 
to 2010, you can start seeing how Daniel Bard's pitches started changing. And this is fundamental to the biomechanical analysis of Daniel Bard, his velocity, his location, and his movement. This is what baseball analysts do. They take data like these to try to better understand the game, better understand individual performances like Daniel Bard's, and hopefully lead to more wins for the various teams. Uh, next slide, please. And that, then we'll move to some physics. Let's run this video. This is interesting because this is a home run, but watch the bat. The bat is let go by the batter here. Watch very carefully as we see this video. Back one minute, sorry about this. Watch the bat, it leaves his hand. He lets go of the bat. He lets go of the bat, but that's still a home run. The physics here are really interesting. Most, the, most coaches and players would understand this, uh, but the, the bat ball impact, what af happens after the bat ball impact essentially doesn't matter. Okay, that's just the physics of the game. So here's some interesting physics. We can start analyzing the bat ball impact and understanding launch angle. Next slide, please. This is more data we can use from pitch FX. This is Dustin Pedroia and his slugging percentage. It gets red when he's hitting the ball very well, hitting lots of doubles, triples, and home runs. And you can see the bottom panel is 2013 and 2014. The top panel is 2011 and 12. Much bigger red spots. Dustin Pedroia was crushing fastballs two years ago, and now he's not. This is data teams use to compete against the Red Sox. Understanding these heat maps, creating these heat maps, and analyzing the heat, these heat maps is fundamental to baseball analytics and fundamental to actually winning games. For and against the Red Sox, this actually hurts the Red Sox because Dustin Pedroia can't seem to hit fastballs anymore. Next slide, please. This is data from a different technology. This is measuring the batted ball, the ball leaving the bat, and different outcomes. There's flyouts, groundouts, line, you know, line drives, popouts, plus all the different hits, singles, doubles, triples, and home runs. They're represented here from a data set from April 2009 where they measured batted ball flight. Next slide aggregates those data. If we can scroll through this, we have the four outs here. You can see the lower point is where ground outs would go. S scroll through these four different, click four times, yep. Those are where the outs are. But these other four dots are where the hits are. And you can see this one point off to the right here is where home runs are. Home runs are particular hits. They've got to be hit at, uh, at a very specific launch angle off the bat at a very high velocity. That's the only way you're gonna hit home runs but technology and data show us this. And now we can go on to even more advanced technology. Let's go to the next slide. Th one more slide here. This is John Lester's pitch set. He's got five different pitches, a four seam fastball, two seam fastball. And I'm gonna compare him to another left-handed pitcher with the same four pitches. And through these data, we can see why John Lester is actually a better pitcher than Jose Quintana. And we can go back and forth on these two slides, backward one forward, backward. The scales are the same here between these two, between these two here. But you can see how much faster and how much more movement John Lester gets on his pitches. This is what you measure using baseball analytics, baseball data. Next slide, please. If you can click through this video here, this is the future. This is what's coming next year, okay? And uh, I don't know if the, there's audio here, but let's play this. Yeah, there is audio here. This is, from, this is from September 2013. Fabulous play by the center fielder Jason Hayward in City Field in New York. Justin Turner was amazed. The pitcher Craig Kimbrell is amazed. But now we get to see the data associated with this play. The batted ball speed, the launch angle, just what I showed you on the previous graph. What's crucial for a home run? Now we get to see the distance covered by Jason Hayward, his velocity, his reaction time, and his top speed. Now watch this catch. It's a fabulous catch. So this is the future. These data are coming next year for baseball analytics. Okay? This is more of the video of Justin Turner and Jason Hayward. It's a, just a fabulous play. But you can see, you can, if you really care about these data, <laughs> 
he says, oh my God, is what he's saying. It's a, it's a fabulous play, and Craig Kimbrell is one of the better pitchers, better closers in baseball, and he's amazed at what, what Hayward did. Next slide, and this is my last slide. I was fortunate enough to teach the first BU MOOC on the edX platform. Some of you may have taken it. Uh, if, I hope you did. If you didn't, it's going to be offered again, and you can sign up and take it. If you care about any of this data I showed you, if you care about baseball analytics, if you care about the idea that baseball can be treated as a science, that we can observe baseball carefully and ask questions, then you might want to take this. We're going to expand the offerings in baseball and on the edX platform here at BU. But it was my privilege to teach this course, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you found this uh, presentation inter interesting, and we have a few minutes for questions, right? Any? Um, would you agree that other sports can turn and are turned into a science? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, right now, today, the NBA, the, the National Basketball Association, uh, major soccer clubs all around the world, they're all using advanced analytics, watching player yes. movement, very similar to what we saw in the, for next year for baseball. All teams are doing it, hockey, football, baseball, soccer. Yeah, it's soccer, everywhere. which is, has such easy rules, but it's also a science. It can be very like much, a chess very game. much so. Very much the same. Same idea as baseball. Yeah, I felt that the uh, Daniel Bard example was an interesting one because I imagine that part of his decline, since it was so sudden, was perhaps psychological. And I was wondering if there is any way to quantify or put into the, uh, use this kind of methods to... To measure his psyche. Yes. Is that what you want to measure Daniel Bard's psyche. Yes. Uh, 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 they've tried. I know they've tried. They, they know, no, I'm serious. They know Daniel Bard very well. They worked with him for years on lots of performance psychology. Uh, they, they have a psychologist on staff for most major league teams now. It, I don't know what happened, but there's certainly a, a very good explanation could be that something happened with his confidence and his ability to perform like he once did. He was lights out for a while, and it's not like his mechanics changed. That's what I was trying to show you. We've actually analyzed his mechanics. They're the same. His biomechanics are all the same. It's just something's different. To explain it, sometimes we just have to shrug our shoulders and say we don't know. And a good alternative explanation could be that he needed, you know, more psychological uh, advice, counseling, help. I don't, I don't know. It's, uh, he's a mystery. Daniel Bard is a mystery. Thank you. Question over here. Do you have any guesses as to how um, no, fans' knowledge that these analytics are becoming more used may affect their experience and enjoyment of the game? I think, here's, here's a fundamental truth about baseball, okay? When uh, baseball was the most popular sport in this country, they were nervous when they started doing radio broadcasts because they said, oh my goodness, no one's gonna come to the ballpark anymore. That didn't happen. Fan interest went up as soon as they showed, as soon as they played radio broadcasts. Then they said, Oh, they're going to show them on TV. No one's going to come to the ballpark anymore. Fan interest went up again. It could, it's a very measurable, measurable advance in attendance. Same thing with these internet versions, showing the, the, the game on the internet live for the world. They thought the same thing. So my prediction is it's going to be absolutely enhancing the fan experience. They're going to try to make these kinds of data available to fans in real time, both remotely and also in the ballpark. And my prediction is again, technology is gonna advance fan interest, uh, just like it always has. It, at every step of the way, there's been an increase in attendance and, and revenue and everything else associated with the game of baseball. So it, I, I predict it'll happen again next year. One more question or are we running out of time? One more question. 
Um, what do you do in there in the case of a player like Ryan Braun, where he has one fantastic season, but then it's supposedly due to steroids and um, do you just throw out that entire year of data essentially, or do you still use it but just sort of with an asterisk? Now we're getting a little more value judgment stuff, and uh, I, I I never use asterisks ever because I you never really know. It's it's hard to start pinpointing who might have used performance enhancing drugs and who didn't, and so because it's it's un, we're unable to identify players who did and didn't. I shrug my shoulders and I treat Ryan Braun straight up like I would treat anyone else. And I just finesse the whole question about who might or might not be using uh, performance enhancing drugs. But that's me, other people have a different value judgment and they get very incensed by all this and they think it's bad. And I, I, just, don't, I just don't think that way. I treat it analytically and enjoy the game either way. I, that's, why I, I mean, that's why I use Barry Bonds as a training tool because that is a fabulous, fabulous swing. It's just brilliant. And if you want to train people to try to get them to learn how to hit the baseball, Pujols and Bonds are just great, great examples. So uh, I don't get too caught up in uh, this PED problem in the game. That's just me, though. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention.